Welcome to another episode of Lever Analytics, hosted by me, Lever KT. Hopefully, you all be keeping it analytical. Up next for our off-season playbook series, we have the Cincinnati Bengals. So I'm going to start this episode off a little differently. Bear with me, because it, it's it's not going to be the you know I I, I pretty much have a, a concept for how I like to attack these things. This one is going to be a treat. I really respect this uh, Cincinnati Bengals fan base. They remind me a lot of the Buffalo Bills fan base. They are loyal to a fault. We are loyal to our teams, but it's nothing that means more to me uh, as fandom is, is is being loyal to your team through the through the good and the bad, and if a lot of it's been bad. So um, I want to start by saying this. Paul Brown and the Brown family are NFL royalty. NFL royalty. Founded the Bengals around 1968. Um, I wanted to go through his coaching tree and kind of show you why he's NFL royalty. And then you'll see how I get back into the script by by talking about Paul Brown. So let's look at, at his coaching tree. And we're going to look at his coaching tree in four tiers. First tier, directly under him. Second tier, under you know, the first tier, third tier, under the second tier, fourth tier, under the third tier, and then finally the fifth tier. First tier, Don Shuler, coached the 72 Dolphins who went undefeated. Only undefeated team in NFL history, both regular season and postseason. Yes, the uh, New England Patriots did it, but they, they didn't quite finish it. Blatton Collier. Weeb Ubank. He won two NFL titles. Three total, but they, they weren't counted as Super Bowls because, you know, he coached it before the uh, Super Bowl era. Bill Walsh. Oh, yeah, you know that guy. Three Super Bowl titles with the 49ers. Chuck Noll. Four Super Bowl titles with the Pittsburgh Steelers. That's just tier one. We still got four more tiers to go. Bill Onsberger. Coach the Giants. Ray Perkins. Coach the Giants and the Bucks. Chuck Knox. Coach the Rams, Bills, and the Seahawks. Buddy Ryan, one of the greatest defense of coordinators of all time, coach the 85 Bears, in my opinion, the greatest defense they ever do it. I know some still, the still current fans have had something to say about that, but I think the 85 Bears and the 2000 Ravens as well. But I think the 85 Bears, that 4-6 that defense was so revolutionary. Um, so I think Buddy Ryan is the greatest defensive coordinator of all time. Mike Holmgren. Oh, yeah, we already know about his coaching tree. John Fox. Tony Dungy. Tier 3, Marty Scheinheimer. And I want to dedicate this episode to Marty Schottenheimer. I want to send my condolences to his family. One of the greatest coaches, man, of all time. Uh, I know a lot of time we're ranked by how many rings we win. There's not too many coaches that can get their team ready to play better than Marty Schottenheimer. And I feel like the Chargers organization uh, kind of owed that man and his family an apology. Got fired at 14 and 2. Despicable. Bill Parcells, tier three. Two Super Bowl titles with the Giants. Jeff Fisher. Say what you want about Jeff Fisher. He's, he's a proven winner. John Gruden. Andy Reid. Lovey Smith. Mike Tomlin. Tier three. <laughs> this is crazy. Paul Brown, man, I'm telling you. He's NFL royalty. Bill Cowher. Tier, f- uh, tier four. One Super Bowl title with the Steelers. Bill Belichick. Six Super Bowls. What else can you say about Bill Belichick? Tom Coughlin. One of the greatest coaches in the NFL and one of the greatest minds. I think Tom Coughlin doesn't get enough respect. Yes, he got two Super Bowls, but um, I think a lot of times um, he was... A lot of people didn't like his coaching style. He was real old-fashioned. Um, but they don't also don't talk about how he, he cured things as well. Tiki Barber coming into the NFL had a family problem. Tom Coughlin fixed that by teaching him a new style of holding the rock. Tier 5, Marvin Lewis. The Brown family is NFL royalty. So I started off by saying that to say this. Why for so long the Cincinnati Bengals were the only team in the NFL without, the in, without an indoor practice facility? I think it wasn't until 2015 where they started uh, busting like 10 minutes away to go to their indoor practice facility. And by the way, it isn't like a, a full field practice facility. It's, it's like about the size of an arena field. Either way, it's still a it's still an indoor practice facility. It, it just do, it doesn't make sense to me. So when I think about Cincinnati, I instantly think about Ohio. Who comes from Ohio? This kid uh, from Akron, named LeBron James, comes from Ohio. 
he spends one point five million dollars on his body per year. Your body is an investment. I think organizations need to start spending more money to make sure these players are healthy and ready for the season. They have to. You have to. It's an investment. I was looking at the training staff for the Cincinnati Bengals, and it's 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 three coaches on their training staff with a total of six years. The average team, I have at least their head athletic trainer, had you know six or seven years in the business. This is an investment. We have to take care of our players. So now let's get into the top five paid Cincinnati Bengal players. Number one, Trey Wayne's cornerback. He's getting fifteen point eight million a year. Missed the entire season due to a torn pectoral muscle. Geno Atkins getting fourteen point seven million a year. He had one tackle this season and only played in one game. DJ Reader getting thirteen point five million a year. He only played in five games. Tyler Boyd nine point eight million a year. Tyler Boyd is very underrated. Buffalo Bills fans love Tyler Boyd. They love Andy Dalton because they they broke the the eighteen year curse of the playoffs. But Tyler Boyd got a PFF grade of seventy five point eight. He had seventy nine catches, eight hundred forty one yards, and four touchdowns. Joe Burrow. He's due to get $8.2 million on the cap this year. He has a PFF grade of 75.1, 13 passing touchdowns, five interceptions. I thought if he played the whole season, he would have got rookie of the year. Um, he only played in nine and a half games. Your top five players, most of which played one game this season. DJ Reader played in five games. Joe Barrow played half a season. You cannot win football games if your team isn't healthy. Period. You seen the 49ers went to the Super Bowl last year. They struggled mightily this year because they couldn't keep their players on the field. Cincinnati Bengals, 4, 11, and 1. They finished fourth in the AFC South. So before we get into their offseason playbook, let's look at this past season and kind of evaluate them. So the Cincinnati Bengals lost six games by one possession. This is a league of one possession games. I continue to say that if you're able to win close games, you will be playing in late January if you're able to win close games. So they lost week one to the L.A. Chargers, 16 to 13, one possession game. Week two in a Thursday night thriller, they lost 35 to 30 to the Cleveland Browns. Week three, they tied. Right there, three winnable games. Instead of starting the season 2-0, I'm sorry, instead of starting the season 0-2-1, they could have been 3-0. Could have been 3-0. That's crazy. Week 5, they got destroyed by Baltimore. Week 6 and 7, one possession losses. They lose to the Colts, 31-27. They lose to the Browns, 37-34. Right there, they could have... Honestly, looking at the schedule, outside of that week five game against the Baltimore Ravens, in the first eight weeks, the Cincinnati Bengals could have been 7-1. That's crazy when you think about it. They could have started the season 7-1. Win your one possession games. It's that simple. Uh, This upcoming offseason, they are projected... Uh, $45.5 million in cap space. That's a lot of money, so it'll be interesting to see how they attack the NFL draft and also how they will attack free agency. So let's go over their 2021 picks. Uh, they got the fifth pick in the first round, uh, 38th overall in the second round, 69th overall in the third round. Uh, in the fourth round, they got the 101st pick. Fifth round, they got the 132nd pick. Um, sixth round, they got the 165th pick. Seventh round, they got the 196th pick. Their team needs, they need an offensive tackle, wide receiver. So, it's a couple of ways you can attack the NFL draft. You can attack team need or you can attack best player available. So, what Cincinnati need to figure out, yes, they need a tackle. Are they going to utilize uh, that that first pick to get somebody like Plains uh, Sewell from Oregon? Are they going to use that to reunite it? And it feels so good. Get another receiver to go with T. Higgins. 
like Jamar Chase, like Devontae Smith. So it'll be interesting to see how the Bengals attacked that first pick. Now, if it were me, I feel like the offensive line is a bigger need. I think uh, teams, the better teams, like uh, you know, top to middle tier teams, can sometimes take the best player available. I always think, in an analytical sense, you always take the best player available. You get your needs by being smart with your later picks. Um, but let's look at the Cincinnati Bengals unrestricted free agents. AJ Green, his market value is around six million a year. I don't see him coming back. I don't foresee him coming back. Um, it'd be interesting to see where he goes. Uh, one thought came to mind was that the L.A. Rams, just to see him and Matt Stafford play in the NFL. I love their uh, combo in college when they were at Georgia together. Mackenzie Alexander. Alexander uh, marketed value is uh, three years, $25 million, $8.4 million a year. So, like I said, Cincinnati has $45 million in projected cap space, so it'll be interesting to see who they decide to, to bring back. William Jackson, three years, $18.9 million, roughly $6.3 million a year is his marketed value. I like William Jackson. I like him a lot. Carl Lawson. I, I feel like if if there's a person they must bring back, it's Carl Lawson, and he's projected it around that four years Thirty five point four million, roughly eight point eight million a year. So I think the Cincinnati Bengals, I think they can definitely write the ship, even in a tough division. I think they can write the ship. And I think with seven teams going to the playoffs, I don't think it's difficult to say that maybe they can get, you know, the wild card teams can be like two teams from this division, if not three. We've seen two wild card teams from this division this year. It'll be interesting to see what the Pittsburgh Steelers do. With Ben Roethlisberger, if they decide to bring them back, the Baltimore Ravens, um, and I talked about them uh, a few episodes ago. They're going to have to figure it out uh, as far as this passing game, and and I and, and I discussed that that they need to figure the passing game out, or teams are going to start doing what the Buffalo Bills did in the playoffs, and like beat us passing. Gonna have to. And then the Cleveland Browns uh, are really good. <laughs> they're really balanced as well. So uh, I think they're another team. If they were a little bit more healthier this year, they could have been one of the best teams in the NFL. It wouldn't have shocked me at all if they were in the Super Bowl, if they were a little bit more healthier. Imagine them almost making it to the AFC Conference Championship game and they had Odell. Now, it's odd that the team seemed to get better after uh, Odell got injured. Uh, well, I don't know if the team got better or if Baker Mayfield got better. Um, and then it'll probably be the latter. I believe Baker Mayfield got better. So we looked at these unrestricted free agents. Out of everyone I just named, uh, let's say uh, we're going to toss two, keep two. Uh, I would say keep William Jackson, keep Carl Lawson. I would say uh, let McKenzie Alexander test the waters. Some Bengals fans probably disagree with me. Also let AJ Green test the waters. I think it's it's, it's time. It really is time. So let's look at the 2021 schedule. Uh, and we don't have the exact schedule yet, but we do have the opponents, so we can kind of make out um, some of the teams they go they're going to end up playing. They got uh, the home games. They got the Baltimore Ravens. They got the Cleveland Browns, Pittsburgh Steelers, Kansas City Chiefs, L.A. Chargers, Green Bay Packers, Minnesota Vikings, Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, away they play the Baltimore Ravens, the Cleveland Browns, Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, they play the Chicago Bears. They play the Denver Broncos. They play the Detroit Lions, the New York Jets, and the Las Vegas Raiders. But I know what you all are here for. Let's get into the off-season playbook for the Cincinnati Bengals. I have three different scenarios that I think that will work well. Um, it's kind of your preference for each scenario. I'm going to name three scenarios. Um, uh, the latter two are probably the ones I think are the better two. Uh, but the third is my favorite. So, But I'll get started with the first scenario. Take uh, Panessa Will from Oregon with that fifth pick in the first round. And in free agency, you want to get uh, Allen Robinson. You do have the money. It, it wouldn't hurt your cap crazily because you're going to have, what, like $47 million in cap space. Um, so Allen Robinson, and yes, his market value is uh, four years, around at $80 million, 
uh, dollars. So you probably get a little bit above that if you wanna if you wanna get them. I don't foresee the Bears resigning them. Uh, one of my analysts on Real Ones Productions, Jalen the Journalist, he's a Patriots fan, but he lives in the Chicago area, and all his family are Bears fans, so he, he pays attention to the Bears. Um, he thought that Allen Robinson production was better than Cole Beasley's uh, production, and he thought that he should have been um, a second-team All-Pro, not Cole Beasley. And that's something we'll debate when we get Jalen the Journalist on this show. But uh, scenario one, take Panay Sewell um, and Get Allen Robinson by any means necessary when free agency hits. Scenario two, take Jamar Chase. And I, and I want to discuss something. This Jamar Chase, Devontae Smith debate is ridiculous to me. Devontae Smith had an amazing year. One of the greatest wide receiver years in history, period. But I, I think that um, y'all forgot about Dre. <laughs> y'all forgot about Jamar Chase, man. Like... I think dude is a more ready NFL prospect. I think the right coach would know how to use Devontae Smith. You get production out of him. Uh, jet jet sweeps, uh, quick screens, just getting him the ball and just getting him to open space, crossing routes, things of that nature. But Jamar Chase is one of the rare receivers, and he's rare because he's going to have good speed. He's going to run, I think, low 4-4s four and a 40. Uh, he has great hands, and he's physical at the point of attack. So... When I when I evaluate him, I look at him like a Chris Carter, even though Chris Carter was a little bit taller than Jamar Chase. They, they're around the same weight, though. Um, excellent hands, great route runner, and somebody who played for the for the St. Louis Rams at the time. They're the L.A. Rams now. But Isaac Bruce, and I think it's time we put respect on Isaac Bruce and Torrey Big Game Hope. Great physical uh, receivers, excellent uh, route runners, uh, doing that greatest show on turf era. So I like Jamar Chase over Devontae Smith. I know some people are going to kill me, especially all of the uh, the Road Tide fans. But give me Jamar Chase. I, I just think if you look at the, the tape, you look at the NFL game, Jamar Chase is more NFL ready. I don't care what anyone says. So with scenario two, I also say take treat Trent Williams in, in free agency. He had a 91.9 PFF grade. He also was an all-pro snub. He should have been on the all-pro team this year. Uh, but his market value is like three years, fifty-four million a year. That's roughly eight, eighteen million a year. He is thirty-two years old, but we know players are playing a lot later these days, especially tackles. And I think tackles can, you know, offensive linemen in general can just play later in their years. Um, and so, with the the last thing for the second scenario is round two. You want to take a guard since you got you got the receiver you wanted, and in my opinion, the best player available at that pick, Jamar Chase. So round two, you want to shore up your offensive line again, so you want to take you an offensive guard. Rashawn Slater, I'm not sure if he'll still be there from Northwestern. Northwestern had a, a phenomenal run game uh, this year and a great defense. But if he is somehow still there uh, for you to get uh, in that second round, you got to take Rashawn Slater. No doubts about it uh, from Northwestern. Um, or uh, Wyatt Davis, uh, and their, uh, Ohio State also had a, a phenomenal run game as well from OSU. So let's get into scenario three. Uh, like I said, I like scenario three the best. I think it makes the most sense, um, and you'll see why in a second. So take Jamar Chase uh, with that fifth pick. I, I think that's what they need to do. Take some get get get, get give Joe Barrow a reason I want to hurry up and get back from this Achilles in, in, uh, injury. I'm sorry from this um, ACL injury and want to play immediately. So. Free agency. Take Brandon Sheriff. He's a mauler. Mauler at that offensive guard. Um, he, and he's 29 years old. So it, it wouldn't be bad at all to take him. Uh, 63 million. Uh, five years, 63 million is, is his market value. Uh, not bad at all. Um, and then second round, take uh, the tackle from Texas, Sam Cosme, um, who's more of an athletic uh, tackle than anything. Um, and you pair him with a mauler like Brandon Sheriff, and I think that would work out really well. Or you can also take uh, the tackle from Alabama, Alex Leatherwood. So get rid of Trey Waynes. You, you definitely got to resign Carl Lawson. Take Jamar Chase with that fifth pick. I'm, I'm promising you, please take Jamar Chase with that fifth pick. And either one or two things, get you a tackle via free agency or get you a guard in free agency. And then the second round, if you if you do choose scenario two and you take Trent Williams, get you a guard like Rashawn Slater or Wyatt Davis. Or if and, and like scenario three, you want to take Brandon Sheriff from free agency. Uh, in that second round, make sure you get your attack on Sam Cosby, 
or Alex Leatherwood or whoever you feel like fits your fits your system the best. So this is the uh, conclusion of episode six of Lever Analytics. As always, I had an absolute ball just researching this team, finding out information that I didn't even know. Want to shout out to my boy Moon Vibes of Real Ones Production. Uh, he gave me a tidbit. I didn't know for the longest that the Cincinnati Bengals did not have an indoor practice facility. And for the longest, they were a most northern team without an indoor practice facility. Of course, if you're playing in Miami, Tampa, or, you know, in that beautiful uh, California sunshine, you don't, you don't really need an indoor facility. So, as I like to say, do something nice that somebody you normally wouldn't do. Always pay it for it. Peace and love. Peace and blessings. And remember, keep it analytical.